we're back and we are going to finish up late adulthood with a nice discussion on friends and relatives. Friends like that, who needs relatives? <laughs> All right. Um, Long-term relationships. It turns out that elders who are married tend to be happier and tend to be healthier than their unmarried counterparts. Now, if we talk about today's cohort of 65 and older, it's more likely, it's likely that about 90% of that cohort were married at some point in their lives. So most of the, of the unmarried elders are not unmarried because they never marry. They're more likely to be unmarried because of divorce or widow. Uh, so you gotta keep that in mind when you say, well, married elders are happy healthier. Well, we gotta take into consideration. I haven't gone through the stress of divorce. I haven't gone through the stress of losing my, my mate. Um, so keep those things in mind. You can also remember that correlations run both ways. We are not sure whether being married causes health, happiness and healthiness or if being a happier person, being a healthier person means that it's more likely that you're still married come the time that you're an elder. So keep those things in mind. Um, it turns out that people who have been married for a long time tend to share that positivity effect we were talking about in the first um, segment of this chapter. Uh, so when the couple can look back on their shared life together with this you know, sort of rosy retrospection where we remember even the negative stuff through a lens of happiness and we overly favor the positive stuff and kind of forget about the un unhappy things. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how that having that shared selective attention um, contributes to higher levels of happiness. Of course, being happier might cause you to have positivity effect, right? And then maybe if you were enmeshed in negativity, you would be more accurately able to help things that happened when you were younger. So again, correlations could flow either way. One of the biggest contributing factors for the healthier part for the married elders is that when you have a live-in partner, you have a live-in person who help care for you if you actually need any kind of assistance. Um, you know, married elders um, oftentimes don't want their kids to know the extent to which there's some kind of physical deficit or something that they're you know, kind of compensating for. They, they just, they work together, keep each other functional and happy and appearing as healthy as they can be. And it's really, they care for each other in ways that make it easier for them to recover when there is an illness or an injury. Um, it also makes it more likely that they eat well. One of the things I mentioned back in the biosocial development chapter was the issue of older people suffering from malnutrition. When they're alone, it's more likely that they'll suffer from malnutrition than when they have a partner. Because they, when you have somebody else to share meals with, it makes it more likely you will have meals. Uh, so, you know, these kinds of things that come just in the synergy of having another person who you're devoted to and have had a lifetime of experiences with, is it more likely um, that you'll have to pause about this? I found this um, on the internet, of course, I don't know the people, <laughs> as usual. Octogenarian couple finishes final marathon holding hands. They agreed that this would be the last. Um, she's run like 123 marathons and he's run like 57 and they agreed this would be their last marathon, and they literally did 26.2 miles, and they, they held hands for the last half mile, and a lot of, it was like, I mean, working together towards a goal, like let's do marathons together, is the kind of thing that makes it more likely that they're healthy at no age. <laughs> um, what about relationships with younger generations, elders and younger generations? You know, today's families are much more like, oops, I got this in the wrong order, a beanpole family. Okay, this is not a beanpole family. This is actually a family tree of my of my husband's family. His uh, dad, Marvin, and his mother, Joyce, had eight children, as you can see on the first level there. My husband was the eighth of children, so he's over there on the far right, Patrick. And then you see among the children, I listed all the grandkids. So you can see my, my kids over there, Sierra and Aspen on the right-hand side, um, all the other grandkids. And then on the third level down there, so it's technically the fourth, but anyway, you see the great-grandchildren. 
And I am embarrassed to say, I don't know the names of all the great grandchildren, and I don't even know who all has them. I don't have enough, I don't have enough kids here. There, there should be 16. I, maybe I put enough boxes. I don't, there's a, they've got a large family. And you know what? This is what American families used to be like. You know, five to eight children was not that atypical. Uh, I frankly, I mean, my, I'm my husband's same age. And I, when he told me he was the eighth of eight children, I literally did a spit take. I was like, what? Who has eight children? What are you talking about? Because I come from a legitimate Bean pole family. There's my mom and dad, Susan and James. They actually had me and my brother, but I could not get this stupid chart to not make it look like my brother was one of my children. So I couldn't figure it out. Uh, so all you're seeing is me. Sorry. So Susan and James had two kids, me and my brother. My brother never had any children. So Susan and James produced two kids. One of their kids produced two kids. I made Sierra and Aspen. So far, one of my kids has had one kid, Juno. So look at that bean pole. And actually, I could have gone up a few more levels if I wanted to, because we could have shown that my mom is one of two children out of my grandma and grandpa. And uh, my grandma is one of three children out of her grandparents. So I mean, you're talking about a serious bean pole family, where it's not spreading out like a big bush, like my, grandpa, like my, my husband's family. We are literally going down, barely replicating ourselves. I'm barely replicating ourselves because my, my mom and her brother, her brother never had any children. So, and then my grandmother, she's one of three, and she only had two kids. Her, her one sister had, I think, three, and the third child never had any kids. So when you have few kids and one of them isn't having any children, it has a bigger impact than like my husband's family where of the eight, three of them never had children. Well, look how many kids are still coming out of this family. Right? Even though most of my husband's siblings only had, if they had kids, they had two, um, they still produced a lot of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, didn't they? So the Beanpole family is this new pattern that has been going on for this last like half century where families are having very small numbers of children, and so we don't have that many extended relatives. Now, familism is um, the feeling of family that motivates us to seek out our distant relatives. So this is a, a picture from the most recent family get-together of my husband's family. Um, we couldn't go, unfortunately. We were up here, and my uh, husband, one of my husband's sisters, who's also not pictured here, um, was having a kidney transplant. So we were taking care of her, and just uh, for full um, storytelling, she is doing fabulously, so that's awesome. Um, but so we were up here caring for her, and so my husband and his sister couldn't come, and yet still look how gigantic that, that group of family is. I mean, that's not everybody at all, and um, giant family. And, and what happens when everybody's going to be there is everybody wants to sort of seek out their relatives. They, this group doesn't see each other like this very often. Um, that full of family is what we call familism. Um, if you come from a beanpole family and you see a group like this, a lot of times you think to yourself, well, maybe I have more relatives somewhere. So maybe you seek out your cousins or, or um, uncles and aunts and stuff. That maybe, you know, that feeling of family, right? And that's familism, that, that desire to find people that we're related to. Um, filial responsibility. It's the obligation of adult children to care for their aging parents. And, you know, filial responsibility is a responsibility that, you know, has been around through humankind, the idea that, that our parents take care of us when we're little, and then we sort of owe them when they get older some degree of care um, when they become old health. Um, in the US, we have kind of this other message, which is, well, but if I'm an adult, I should be self-sufficient. So that means as we go from child to adolescent, we start struggling for our independence and our autonomy. Don't tell me what to do. I should go where I want to. I can spend my money how I want. And then on the other end, when maybe we are starting to need a little bit of care, we don't want to tell our children, I need your help, right? Because we've been sort of trained self-sufficient. That's a, a part of our, our culture. Um, so as a result, parents may not want help that they need. I kind of mentioned that in the last segment, that a lot of times, uh, it was just earlier in this segment, uh, a lot of times married couples will sort of keep private any um, 
struggles that they might be having financially or physically because they don't want to burden kids with it. They feel like, you know, we should be able to take care of ourselves. And that's, you know, the counter, you know, we've got this filial responsibility that I think a lot of people feel naturally, um, competing with sort of American ideal of, you know, independence and not wanting to have to rely on somebody else. So when we are in our elder years, on average, most people are likely to have children, and on average, those children are probably going to be adults. I mean, if you're 65 or older, most of the time, if you have kids, they are probably 45 or 35, something like that. They're adults, and they have their own stuff going. Since I always pull stuff off the internet, I thought I'd share a picture of my family. So I'm there in the green shirt, and my mom is on the left, and that's my daughter in the middle holding my first grandbaby, Jennifer. And I thought I'd show this picture because, of course, it's familism where you want to you know, be tight with your family and stuff like that. But as adults, there's always that little tension that can be sort of simmering under the surface. Look how happy we are. We're all excited to be taking the baby out to get cocktails for the first time. Okay. See my husband in the back. Um, the thing is, it doesn't matter how old you get. Your parent always feels like parenting. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how successful you are. Your parent always still is older than you. I'm sorry, they are older than you and they might have some wisdom to impart, right? Um, but their attention, the, maybe, the, maybe the parent doesn't want to say anything because they're afraid of offending the adult child. Um, and then maybe being excluded as a result. Right? Maybe the adult child's going to get their nose bent out of shape and say, you know what, let's not invite grandma next time. Uh, but it's just a truism. Parents are always going to parent. And um, children are always going to want their parents' approval. Um, so one of the things that I've learned from my years of teaching lifespan development is to say that to my daughter. I'm sorry, I know you are a full-grown adult, You've made another human. <laughs> but uh, you're still my baby. And in fact, that my, in this picture, this is like a two-week-old picture as, as of the time I'm recording this. So this stuff is all very current for me. Um, I was lucky enough to get to be in the delivery room while my grandbaby was born. And my, mom, my daughter was saying to me, I want you there. I, I, I really need you to be there. She goes, I'm not sure about anybody else being in the room. I know I want you and my husband there, and that's, that's who I want. And I was just terrified. I was going to say something wrong, that I was going to get all protective of her and start demanding, you know, no matter what she says, it's time for her epidural. I mean, I was like, <laughs> I was very worried about how I, what mama bear might do in the delivery room. I mean, I was so nervous about it. I was driving up to meet her at the hospital by myself, and I, would, I called my... I kind of started to express it to my husband, and he dismissed my feelings. So I went and I called my friend from high school, and I'm like, I'm going to the hospital. My daughter's going to have a baby, and she, I get to be in the delivery room. But what if I say something wrong? You know how I always stick my foot in my mouth. What if I say something wrong? And she kicks me out. My friend was just laughing, going, you're going to do fine. You're going to do fine. I was just so worried that I was going to be her mom rather than expecting grandma. Um, just the good news on the story is I managed to my mouth shut most of the time and just be super supportive. And you know, there were points at which I almost called for the epidural, but that girl was laboring for 30 hours. Um, but she got it done and she did not my she did not need me to second guess anything she was doing and um, I managed to pull it off. And uh, and then after it was over, it really reiterated the second part of this where she was like, You think I did a good job? Yeah, you did a great job. You were you were such a stud. I mean, you were like, it was amazing. And she just basked in my in my approval. And you know, both of us were worried about how we were gonna behave. And you know, I I hope she was as sincere in saying that she was happy I was there as I was. Pride how well she did. But it's it's a tough little dance. And my mom and I were just discussing it recently. That you know, my mom and my dad sailed off to Mexico when I was uh, when my daughter was a year old. And I said, you know, I missed out on having a mom to 
to support me through my childbearing years. And my mom said, well, you know, I didn't want to have the conflict that I always had with my mom. So she was afraid that I would reject her if she tried to parent or second guess me. And I mean, this is a dicey thing that we all go through. So, um, you know, it's a struggle that everybody, everybody goes through. Everybody goes through it. 85% of people over the age of 65 are grandparents. And so this is, um, you know, dealing with grandchildren is something that most people at some point in their life are going to deal with. And there are different ways that people handle it. Some people are remote grandparents. They show up with big events. They uh, maybe send a card or some money. And you know, they're just not really that intimately involved. But they, you know, are proud of their grand grandkids. They talk to them on the phone maybe. But they are very much more distant. Even if they live in the same town, they might emotionally distant. And they're the companion grandparents whose job they feel like is to play with their grandkids and enjoy their grandkids and you know they really feel like fun uh, you know energy from their grandkids and so we call those companion grandparents. And there are what we call involved grandparents who just do like sort of everyday stuff with their grandkids. They don't have like let's go to Disneyland or you know let's go play at the park but instead you know they bake cookies together or do the dishes. And like everything is just sort of like part of life being together. It's just we are with each other in each other's lives. Uh, and then there are the parents who, the grandparents who actually become parents to their grandkids. And that's a growing number of grandparents these days who are taking on the dual role of I'm your grandparent, but I'm also the person who's actually raising you. Um, so a lot of times the surrogate grandparents are, are in that position, not because that's their style, but that's um, you know, circumstances have put them in that position for one reason or another. Um, sometimes the other three categories are not necessarily chosen by the grandparent either. It's just sort of how they are. This is my personality. Or it's my stage in life. Like, um, you know, had I had children younger, maybe my, I, I had my first born when I was 27, which is pretty young these days, but back then my parents were like, we should have done this five years ago. We've already made our retirement plans. We're out of here kind of thing. And um, so they became remote, remote grandparents, but I think my dad would have been much more of a companionate grandfather if he'd been at home. And I think my mom would have been much more of what looks like an involved grand, grandma who would have been like teaching my daughter to sew and other kinds of little things, right? So sometimes it's circumstances. Sometimes it's personality style. You know, some, parent, some grandparents just really aren't the fun-loving types of people. I mean, some people just don't like romping around and playing games, and so they become... Um, involved or the remote type because they aren't the fun loving type naturally. So different approaches. There's not necessarily a way to grandparent that is a good way. It really is um, important for grandparents to be aware that just like any other relationship in life, um, it needs to be a give and take. And a lot of times grandparents forget that. They feel like, well, I am how I am and the grandchild has to deal with it, as opposed to, um, you know, maybe, maybe responding to what the grandchild is more than um, just the grandchild has to fit into the life that's already here. Friends. Okay, so I got another picture that's a personal one. That's my mom. She's recovering from her hip surgery. And that's her best friend, Ellie, from high school over there being on the, on the couch. And I thought this is such a classic example of companion, companionship that can come from having a good friend. My mom's lucky. She has several. But um, when it was time for her hip replacement, she didn't want to do it. And her friend said, you come stay at my house. I will attend you during the recovery period. You stay at my house, and I will do this with you. And um, kind of made it impossible for my mom to say no. And so, um, and that's what, you know, having a, just one friend is all it really takes for a person to experience good psychological adjustment. Just having one good friend who gets you is enough for all of us at any stage of life. And so if we can, in old age, have somebody doesn't have to be somebody like this too, where they've known each other since high school. It could be somebody who you met and clicked. Um, that's all it really takes. Um, but one good friend is good for social adjustment. I can't end without addressing the issue of the frail elderly. We've been looking at um, you know, elderly people who are active and still doing really well. What about the frail elderly? These are people who are physically infirm. Maybe they're very ill. Maybe they've got a cognitive disability. Some um, one of the dementias, or um, maybe it's something that's a developmental disability that's been with them their entire lives. Uh, most older adults will, will become frail at some point if they live long enough. Usually our last 
part of our lives will be spent in a little bit of frailty for some period of time. It's most common in the months right before death. Most people don't dwell in frailty for really, really long amounts of time. So when we talk about frailty, what we talk about uh, their ability to complete the activities of daily living. You're in this area, um, those of you who are going into nursing, and maybe if you're going to work with older people, you'll get really um, familiar with these little shortcut things that ADLs. Uh, but it's all the things that are just normal things that you have to do to be a self-sufficient person. You know, bathing, toileting, dressing, you know, getting out of your bed into a chair and back, things like that. Um, if you can't perform one of those, we can see that you're starting to move it to what we call frailty, where you're going to need some assistance. You're having difficulty, having difficulty getting from the bed to the chair. Now, it might be something. It might be something completely uh, temporary. Like after my mom's hip surgery, we could argue that she was having difficulty transferring from a bed to a chair. But that was temporary, and she recovered from that. So you know, she she hadn't moved into frailty. She had this period where she was more frail than usual, um, and that's the thing to be uh, considered: is that is this a change that is unlikely at first? Um, the other measure of frailty would be instrumental activities of daily life. I got this picture from these two women are English. And they used to have this cooking show called Two Fat Ladies. <laughs> and it is two women. And um, they would run around the English countryside and cook a meal at different places that was appropriate to where they were. So when they went to cook for the lumberjacks, they made a meal that was appropriate for lumberjacks and so on. And they were absolutely in their retirement phase. Um, so I've got this picture of them, though, because one's riding a motorcycle, the other one's a sidecar at least, but um, it's an example of they still, at their age, were non-frail in part because of their ability to do these instrumental activities of daily life, like driving. Uh, you know, they were able to handle complex uh, tasks that require intellectual competence and forethought. So that's what we mean by instrumental activities of daily life. You know, can you remember that it's time to pay your bills? Remember the procedure for paying your bills. Remember across the month to, co you know, collate all the bills as they arrive and then sit down to pay them. You know, those kinds of, you know, you have to, you have to, to plan, put some thought into it, and then ex execute the plan. Um, so if a person still ha can handle their um, instrumental activities of daily life, it's much more likely they also uh, are able to do their activities of daily living. So. Um, you know, usually these kinds of things change in concert, right? You're going to start to notice that you can't do the activities of daily living at, after probably the instrumental activities are. are okay. uh, so these are ways that we can kind of measure how frail a person really is. Uh, the instrumental daily, the instrumental activities of daily life are those things that if you can't do these things, then we really can't um, sort of live independently, can we? Because you got to go out and get your groceries. Although you can order that is true um, we've come like full circle in the 40s you could order your your uh, groceries delivered and then we went through a period of time where you had to go out and get them and then now we're kind of back to we can order them delivered if we want so that might not be the best example um, <laughs> but if you have difficulty handling these kinds of things it's gonna be harder for you to live on your own because the bills are gonna start to go past due your water gets shut off things like that um, because you're not taking care of business so Caring for the frail elderly. This is my last thought on the frailty. Um, you know, during that period of time that I'll ultimately enter if we have a natural death, is we'll go through this period of frailty where we need to take care of. Um, who is the person who's most likely to care? Well, a lot of times it's the spouse. Um, and it's one of those things that will keep married people out of hospitals longer than non married people because if you have a spouse, they will feel like it's their duty to take care of you. And so that gives at least one of the members of the partnership this extra grace period where they don't have to go into assisted living or they don't have to go into a hospital or they don't have to you know, rely on their adult kids. Um, the next most common caregiver would be adult children. And in the US, the most common adult child caregiver would be the, a daughter. Um, that's sort of our social norm that when mom or dad needs care, Daughter, one of the daughters, if there's more than one, will usually step up or maybe they rotate through or whatever. 
Um, sons in the U.S. are more likely to provide financial support, and daughters are more likely to provide actual care. In other countries, it's flipped. Where this, well, I shouldn't say it's completely flipped. Um, in other countries, the son is the more responsible. The filial responsibility falls on the son, but the actual caregiving oftentimes falls on his wife. So the daughter-in-law oftentimes becomes the caregiver of her in-laws. So um, in some countries where there are more males than females, one of the things that parents are really worried about is who's going to take care of me in my old age if my son never gets married. Uh, so the next most common caretaker would be adult children, either the actual daughter or the daughter-in-law is the most common. It's the least common to have professional caregivers. Despite the ads you might hear on the radio or TV where they're saying, you know, um, a place for mom and, um, you know, visiting angels and all these other things, those uh, private, you know, professional caregivers are, are uh, the least common caregivers. It's usually somebody who does it for free and does it because they love the person and feel responsible for the person. Um, and one of the things about that is that, you know, the caregivers tend to experience a lot of stress. It's hard to be an ongoing caregiver over any amount of time. And uh, a lot of times caregivers have no idea how to even get a day off. You know, they have no idea how they would even, they think thoughts like, well, I, could, I can't afford to get a professional in. And they don't even know what assistance might be available or other things. Um, so they just dismiss it and say, well, I just have to keep going. And that, you know, if, if the frailty persists for a significant length of time, it can really undermine the health of the caregiver. Uh, they can actually start to physically kill themselves. So it's really important for, for um, if you know anybody who's acting as a caregiver, or you know, just give them an afternoon off, or uh, you know, find some resources to discover whether they could, in fact, afford to have a professional come in, at least for like the bathing responsibilities or, or something else. Uh, because it can be really stre stressful on, I put here, relationships, not on the relationship, not on the relationship between, let's say, the spouse and the, and the person who's frail, or um, between the adult child and the person who's frail. It can be stressful on all the relationships. So let's say that you are the, the daughter who has stepped up to help care for your parents, and let's say you have a sibling. At some point, there may be some friction between the siblings as you start to say, I'm doing all this stuff. I've given up all the things I normally do. I'm under all this stress, and you're not even helping. And then the, the sibling who's maybe giving money will say things like, well, but I've been paying this and that bill. And, right? and so you can imagine that there might be arguments, and there could be stress, and there could be finger pointing, and this can actually cause a rift. Uh, so a lot of times we feel responsible. We feel like we need to be the caregiver, and, and that you know, if I truly love this person, I'll take care of them. But it's really super important for caregivers to take care of themselves and for people around caregivers to give them a lot of grace and to just give them little small respites that just can help to recharge the batteries. All right, in the next segment, we'll talk about death and dying. So brace yourself for that.